Okay, horror movie makers, how about a little breakfast? This just shows you how much fun a prop master can have in cooking up a little excitement for the movie they're making. Here's a prop master in his rural domain. He's got his overalls and his antlers and his fabric and skull, almost like a Hans Holbein painting from the Renaissance. Here is more present day actor in the prop making profession. Of course, the famous robots in uh, the Star Wars trilogy, probably one of the most famous props of our, all time, the R2-D2 props. And here is Russell Bobbitt, who is the king of prop making these days, uh, the prop maker for Iron Man 1, 2, and 3, showing off his uh, futuristic items. Your normal prop maker will have his or her truck with all the props, and on those trucks will be different kits, different boxes of particular implements for particular scenes. It's a good way of separating things uh, to make it clear when you do the shoot. They'll also have a shop or a mill where they'll uh, make the props that usually aren't the real item because it's uh, more expensive to use the real item or it might be hard to uh, have coverage insurance lines with the real item, or maybe the actor just is involved in an action scene where it might be thrown around. So here, we'll have prop makers, they'll mold, they'll sculpt from styrofoam, they'll use clay models, they'll do all sorts of um, creations and sculpting. And you have to be a pretty good sculptor as well as mechanic to be a prop maker. And here we have a prop maker at work in his shop. When you're not making props, you're going to go down to the prop house. I talked about this is one. Uh, that has a room very similar to ours here at Six and Haynes in Albuquerque where there's a western collection of gear. Here's a prop maker going through the decision making process. We have Spielberg getting excited about his script and giving some direction to his actor. But the man in the t-shirt who's listening to Jackson is the prop maker getting some um, um, guidance about uh, what to put in the scene involving this actor. Prop makers, uh, they're going to have everything that's touched by the actor, but they're also going to have big props that might be thrown around. And so they might have to not only deal with the actor, but deal with the dummy in lieu of an actor. Here are two prop mistresses on the shoot of The May. Um, and I just call attention to it because this is very... Um, much uh, issue in movies. They have prop food. Now, I told you before that the props department has to make the food for the actors who will be eating because that's what's going to be touching. So they'll put this spread out on the table here and people will come by, confuse it with craft services. And so the props people um, have to put signs that please prop food, don't touch because uh, people are always eating on these long shoots. And sometimes I've known prop masters who, in order to discourage people from snacking on props, will put uh, hot sauce with a lot of Scoville units, maybe a million Scoville units in the hot sauce, so that if somebody should try to sneak uh, a snack, their mouth will end up being on fire. Here's a props person who um, didn't know, according to her interview, that one of the uh, task for the prop department is you bring the chairs, the folding chairs for Video Village to set. The director's chair, the script continuity chair, those folding chairs, time out of tradition, props are in charge of. Not not uh, anybody else, no no assistant directors or PAs or anything, but props is the time out of role of handling chairs in front of Video Village on the set. Here's a prop person, prop master actually, who's checking out the scene as they're lighting it, making sure all the props are in place with his clipboard, probably doing a checklist to make sure everything is set up. Here's another job, common job for a prop person, is showing the actor how to handle that uh, chainsaw that's going to be used in this fun scene coming up. Or the prop person could be on set here during the battle scene, making sure they've got their muskets prepped and ready since the... Uh, uh, Extras who are in this scene probably know nothing about um, how to operate the gun. And in action battle scenes, again, we're going to be 
uh, all these props here, this armor, the swords, all these things are props, and the actor who is, of course, touching and using them, it has to be explained how to handle it and what they're going to do with it. And usually the person who can talk to the actor, the only person who can really talk to the actor other than the director is the props master. Here we have a props master, the man from Dexter, Mr. Meltzer. He, um, he's had a lot to do with that TV series, of course, has a lot of props that are grisly and have to do with uh, the torture and killing that goes on throughout the series. Um, but he gives an example of a, a scene where the director came up to him and said, I want you to create a retractable knife that is fully retractable. And Metzger said, a fully retractable knife is a near impossibility in Proptum. As a knife blade is longer than its handle, it physically can't vanish all the way. So instead, Meltzer built three knives so that the scene could be stitched together in editing. There was the real knife uh, for uh, Dexter's kill kit, a rubber one for him to swing down on his victim, and then for the moment when the blade plunges, a retractable version where the handle was much bigger and the blade much shorter. The only time they ever saw the knife is when it was in Dexter's hand and it was flying through the, flame for, flying through the frame for a few seconds, just as he plunged the knife into the actor's chest, so it became sort of like a magic trick. Obviously, um, this was in Dexter's final kill, and the 3 in 1 knife has gotten plenty of use since then on the series. In Season 6, Episode 8 of Dexter, there was a uh, local taxidermist, Meltzer says, who worked in the film industry out there in L.A., and he created all sorts of amazing props. And so Meltzer went to him and said, Hey, here's one for the files. I need to create a seven-headed alligator. The alligator was to become part of the Horror of Babylon tableau in service of the Doomsday Killer's biblical agenda. In the book of Revelation, the Horror of Babylon appears on the back of a seven-headed beast. So he went through his hides and we found the largest alligator skin that he had, and he, and he taxidermied that, and then he just went through the stock of gator heads, and he put together the 700 alligator that was just simply amazing, as you can see. Because the victim in the tableau was a school teacher, the scene was shot at an elementary school. Thankfully, the school was not in session, but um, uh, Meltzer, walking down the street with the 700 alligator under his arm, did turn a few heads. And here's one. Here's a bonus for aspiring prop masters. It's Dexter's proprietary blood recipe. The industry standard is that all liquid blood is a syrup base. What kind of syrup you use is where you get into your secret formulas, Meltzer, Meltzer says. So he has a special syrup he uses for his base, and he adds food coloring. Then he adds a couple drops of Dawn dish soap because it helps with the cleanup. And then if he's doing it outside, he adds a couple drops of peppermint oil because bees hate peppermint, so you won't have any bee problems. Recently, the Dexter Prop Department has adopted an ingenious time-saving measure, portable silicone pools of blood, which can be laid down underneath the victim. Meltzer augments them with reusable blood drops, which can be peeled off and stuck to the surface like color forms. The cleanup is much easier, he says, and you don't have an actor lying in a pool of syrup for hours and then dripping it all over every time you change the camera angle. I used this shot earlier of uh, Costner and the Macho Buddies doing their props for you know, Western, but... We have women in the business doing uh, props and uh, well-known prop makers. Here we have one, Katrine Hillegard, who does props for the Survivor TV series. And what she does is, um, uh, she's seen here on the left standing uh, with the crew. You can see the whole video village and the sound cart and everything. Um, and a typical day for her starts the night before. She goes to a briefing every night around 9 where they discuss the past day and what stories are happening among the Contestants, and then they work it out, and the editorial team kind of knows what's, what they want to focus on the following day. So um, what happens is they have to create the props for the next day. So when the sun comes up, uh, there's a, a big game to basically be built. And so she works starting at 8 a.m., and throughout the day in the Carpenters area, just creates props for the Survivor Series. Here's, we can see one she's uh, got on the beach for them. And here's some signs, as you know, in Survivor, they always have to go running through the jungle and signs designate whatever they got to do or whatever they got to find. And then when she uh, creates, this is kind of more of the makeup job here, but she's tasked as a Survivor multitasking kind of job. And here are more of the uh, clues and cards that one has to find. She has to create this every day. So she's a very active prop maker, uh, making good money because it has to be done on the scene at the time of the shoot. And here, speaking of very good prop makers, is Russell Bobbitt, the dean of all prop makers. And here he's on set um, working with a prop 
with his assistants. And here he is on um, Captain America, as he in the background. Uh, those shields and what they're wearing, those are props. Uh, not really wardrobe, but they're props. And of course, he's gotten his major acclaim for all the props on Iron Man 1, 2, and 3. And so if you are an ace prop maker, you will end up getting the big time rewards just like Russell Bob.